name's Stina. I'm an artist based in Glasgow. Uh, and this is my first time in Dumfries. Uh, and I'm very happy to be invited. Uh, I don't have so much to say about the conflict in Dumfries, obviously. But uh, given the theme of tonight, I thought I'd talk a little bit about being inspired by artists, older artists, and looking at work that's happened <coughs> in sort of recent history. I work mainly with video and film, uh, which is not particularly easy to show in a very fast slide show like this, and I'm not going to attempt to show any finished pieces at all tonight. Um, some of the images you'll see are from, uh, are stills from my videos, some are just from my sort of archives that I um, work with, and I'm going to tell you a little story about um, something that I discovered a couple of years ago. In the summer of 2010, I came across a text called Joker, a game of incidental urban poker in an anthology by Stuart Holm. Came across makes it sound light-hearted and coincidental. The fact is that, that since this publication is out of print, I had travelled across to Edinburgh, where I had tracked down a reference copy at the National Library. The text, anonymously written under the name of Workshop for Nonlinear Architecture, tells the story of a man who finds playing cards in the streets of Glasgow in the spring of 94. The Four of Diamonds is the first card he finds, and it doesn't seem significant at the time, but when he stumbles upon a Five of Diamonds, this leads him to frenetically search for the Six. The text speculates on how poker games between cities could be arranged just by using found cards. The story resonates well with the way I work as an artist. I walk a lot and I collect footage and stories as I go along. And I'm also interested in coincidence and the border between chance and choreographed events. I had read about the Lettrist movement who undertook derives or drifts as we would call them. Psychogeography was an area I didn't know that well, but the more I read about it I realised that I'd been doing it. And not only was this something that had been explored by the Lettrists in Paris in the 50s, but a lot closer to home in Glasgow in the 90s. Sitting in the huge reading hall of the reference library, I felt a kinship with the author of this story, or the group as it were. How come I hadn't heard of them before? The Wikipedia entry had not said very much, except that they were fiercely against publicity. Had they succeeded in deleting themselves from the Glasgow art scene history? I spent some time asking around amongst my artist friends if they knew anything about the group, but I didn't find out much. It struck me that perhaps this was all outside of the art scene. Perhaps this group did not consist of folk who would have called themselves artists. I contacted the author of the anthology of the Joker that the Joker was published in. He gave me the name of the person who wrote it, and I Google search, searched him, and it was revealed that he was an interior designer based in London. His CV fitted with having spent time in Glasgow in the early 90s, but the email address didn't work. Ready to give up, I sent an email to his colleague at the Design Bureau, asking her to forward my message to him. Since I was working on a collaborative book project at the time, I wanted to republish the text and also, if possible, interview the author about it, the group and their activities. I thought that they deserved a better remembered place in the canon of the Glasgow miracle art scene and hoped to do my part. After about a week of not hearing from his colleague, I got an email. He did indeed play a small part in the workshops and activities. It would not be appropriate for him to discuss what was done, why or who by, as the workshop was committed to strict anonymity and a refusal to publicise. He was actually expelled in 96, shortly, shortly before the workshop's demission for collaborating on the text, and had no further comment. Like a roller shutter, this went down before me. I wasn't going to get any further with this. How typical that when I finally found somebody who did exciting work, I was shut out. I went back to the text and took note of some of the places that are mentioned in it. I might be digging in the past, but at least the city is the same, and I thought I could revisit some of the sites. It describes the pedestrian zone of Sucky Hall Street as a negative psychogeographic sink, which seems to me just as appropriate today as back then. Even though it was written 20 years ago, um, several of the places that, it, that the text talks about are actually gone, like the market and several of the back lanes. In one section, the protagonists meet with a group at the Mitre Bar. This bar was in the Merchant City, a few blocks from Transmission Gallery. Standing outside the boarded-up entrance, I had a sense of déjà vu as I was being locked out yet again. I couldn't even nurse a pint and imagine the group meeting there. 
The mitre bar sits right on the edge of a huge area that was bought up by Selfridges about 10 years ago. Most of the businesses are shut down, but Selfridges have since changed their plans about building a giant luxurious store, and the blocks are now derelict and crumbling in limbo. The neon sign of the mitre bar has been moved to a lane a few blocks down that is owned by the council. Douglas Gordon's neon piece, Empire, was originally next to the mitre bar, and it's also been moved here. In a few generations, who will know, and will it matter, that they have been displaced from their original position? I did not want to give up on finding at least a photograph of the inside of the mitre. Nothing came up at the Mitchell Library, and no photos turned up in Transmission Gallery's archive either. Although from old flyers, I could tell that they did indeed arrange performances and artist talks there, before abandoning it for another pub. In the end, it was Alan Dimmick who provided me with the photograph in front of you. This is a small lounge on this first floor of the Mitre. It was a tiny place, and this was taken during one of Transmission's performance nights. Looking at this grainy black and white photo, the 90s seemed so long ago, it could almost have been the 1890s. I have not found any photos of the downstairs bar, but the shop front of the Mitre has, and the beer taps have recently been installed at the Riverside Transport Museum uh, as part of their 1920s street, street display. Here the wooden panel sits almost as a part of the theatrical scenery preserved for the future. Fact and fiction blend with history. Both personal and collective memories are made in the present moment. They are made up from everything that leads up to that very instant we choose to look back. Once you have found something out, it's impossible to go back and take that knowledge away. I did end up republishing the Joker text. We launched the book last summer with a reading of it from an empty stage at the ICA in London. I have thought a lot about whether I'm now ruining workshop for nonlinear architecture's hard work of trying to delete their impact on future generations of artists, but if that is the case, I take full responsibility for it. Many of the people who tell me that since I have told them this story, they keep finding playing cards in the streets. I've not been so lucky. I never find playing cards and would make a rubbish player in the poker between cities. A couple of weeks after the book launch, though, as my husband was opening up the deli where he works and as he was sweeping up by the outside tables, this unexpected gift presented itself to him. <laughs> he kindly passed it on to me on my birthday and it's now my Jack of Diamonds by proxy. I'm holding on to him for any future games. <laughs>